Thank you very much, Nikki. Thank you very much, Sandra, for the very kind invitation. Uh, next slide, please. I will give you an overview of the field of um, geriatric oncology today and actually how I see it as really a fantastic opportunity to achieve what we call precision oncology. And I hope I will convince you that it's all about multi-professionality, interdisciplinarity, working uh, medics like me, with nurses, a lot of care professionals, to really provide with patients with the best um, care. Um, my disease specific interest is breast, as you can see here. I also have an interest in geriatric oncology. I'm very honored to lead uh, SIOC, the International Society of Geriatric Oncology, and uh, quite involved also the European Cancer Organization. So two multi-professional organizations that um, um, really highlight the opportunities that uh, lie in you know, multidisciplinarity. Next slide, please. These are my disclosures. Next slide. So, cancer is a disease of aging. Um, if you look, for example, at the statistics, these are from uh, the States. 50% of the diagnosis and 70% of the mortality from cancer occur at the age of 65. And we are seeing an increase in the burden of cancer in the older age groups as opposed to the younger age groups. Um, these are again projections from the states between 1975 up to 40, showing a 17 fold increase of the burden of cancer above the age of 85, as opposed to a four fold increase under the age of uh, um, 65. That really highlights that older patients should be a priority for uh, education. And this is why today's day is quite important research, clinical implementation, and, that, and also uh, national cancer control plans. Next slide, please. On the other hand, gaps of knowledge on how we should manage cancer in all the patients. And it always strikes me to remember that we've been knowing this for more than 25 years, since 1999, paper on the New England of Medicine, uh, looking at the recruitment of all the patients in registration trials from the Southwestern Oncology Group um, Southwestern South in the States them with uh, um, the prevalence of um, cancer in real world, um, all the patients in the, in, the, in the States. Showing, for example, the patients recruited into these uh, registration trials were 65 plus as opposed to 63% in the US point. And 15 years later, we've made very little progress. Our theory showed again that among the um, studies um, sponsored by the National Cancer less than 10 percent of patients plus as opposed to 20 cancer patient population at that stage initially we were excluding older patients from innovation and uh, clinical trials because of age restrictions now we are excluding them because of uh, very strict eligibility criteria pertaining uh, for example comorbidities um, other cancer diagnosis or because we are really mandating very burdensome uh, trial procedures that they cannot always uh, um, actually adhere to um, next slide please and this is obviously a problem because what we call the external validity, so the applicability of the evidence that we are using, I am using every day to issue my treatment recommendation to real world, all the patient may be less applicable in, again, real world patients. This leads to treatment variation. We documented this in the Bridging the Age Cap study that we published a few years ago. This was a prospective course study running in across 56 breast units, um, recruiting patients over the age of 70 with operable breast cancer, more than 3,000 women. Um, a contemporary court, 2013 to 2018, showing, for example, that even when we identify fit patients based on geriatric assessment, we will learn more about this today, um, with high risk early stage breast cancer, so that could potentially benefit from chemotherapy, only less than 30% of these patients were actually offered chemotherapy, potentially um, highlighting some degree of undertreatment in this patient population. Well, again, the age is no barrier to chemotherapy analysis led by Janine Mansia, guys, and Thomas's hospital, um, looking at uh, what is the sheer degree of uh, variation in the use of systemic anti cancer treatment over the age of 70 versus uh, under the age of 70, again, in real world patients in England. Um, these are funded plots, as you can see, that essentially um, every trust, every hospital in England is plotted against the caseload on the x axis and the rate of systemic anti-cancer treatment used on the y-axis. Look at, uh, obviously, what is the significant large degree of variation 
in the older patient population versus the uh, younger patient population, despite adjusting for performance status, comorbidity characteristics in this large patient population. Next slide, please. Um, one of the major hurdles for clinicians that occurs in the clinic, and this is uh, true for medics, nurses, and medical professionals, is that all the patients are very heterogeneous. As we age, we become increasingly diverse because we are constantly subject to the selective pressure of cancer, comorbidities, different health behaviors. We live in different places in the world. We have different levels of social support, and we can see in the clinic very fit elderly patients with a longer life expectancy and a minimal burden of uh, comorbidities, functional impairment, a good organ function reserve, but the focus of cancer care could still be prolonging survival. At the other end of the spectrum, frail patients with significant burden, competing risks of morbidity and mortality, polypharmacy, uh, reduced organ function, functional impairments that are, have an increased risk of severe complications, even on adapted anti-cancer treatment approaches where the focus of cancer care should increasingly shift from quantity to quality of life. And sometimes telling the difference between identifying these two different categories of patients or clinicians is quite difficult if we do not ask the right questions. Next slide, please. And these are the right questions to ask. Um, the complexity of managing uh, these patients is, is uh, obviously um, related to the fact that there is a gradual decline in the function of multiple organs in the system, but also uh, a higher burden of comorbidities, small problems, polypharmacy, malnutrition, functional impairments, lack of social support and activity. And it's not always clear from published trials what is the potential impact on, of emerging treatment options on quantity versus quality of life in the specific large and increasing patient population. Next slide, please. And these are the same concerns that the patients actually are uh, keen and the families as well to discuss with us in the clinic. How will this treatment affect my autonomy, my independence? Um, will I fall again on treatment? How will this affect my other health conditions? Um, will I get confused again? Will I get delirium? Um, how can I improve my mood? Uh, what resources are there in the community to, for example, help me attend my weekly hospital appointments for chemotherapy? Um, how can I increase or maintain my weight? How will I tolerate the treatment? Next slide, please. And there is a significant risk of over-treating or under-treating this specific patient population. This is a beautiful review that was published by a geriatrician based in Boston on JCO in 2020, showing really eloquently how we should consider under-treatment in older patients with cancer. It's giving them less intensive treatments, whereas they are quite fit and may benefit from an escalated treatment approach, or not providing non-oncologic interventions to help reverse or improve, at least, geriatric domains, regardless of what cancer treatment they receive. Over-treatment is obviously giving these patients uh, treatment that are very unlikely to lead to any meaningful symptom relief in the remaining lifetime, but also giving them too intensive treatment, whereas they are vulnerable and may actually benefit from a de-escalated treatment approach. Okay. Next slide, please. And um, Anne, uh, my colleague Anne Barrel will uh, talk about this in details, but this is the reason why we should always use geriatric assessments in all the patients with cancer when making treatment recommendations. And specifically, a comprehensive geriatric assessment, which is combining frailty assessment with multidisciplinary interventions, addressing health domains that matter to patients, comorbidities, functional status, performance, incontinence, malnutrition, polypharmacy, cognition, sleep, social support and activity, mood, quality of life, hearing, vision, genetic syndromes. These are all aspects of uh, the, the health of all the patients with cancer that we should take ownership of also in the oncology field. Next slide. And these should um, obviously be linked to personalized multidisciplinary interventions. Next slide, please. And these interventions, for some of them, as a medic, as a medical oncologist, are next about. So adapting anti-cancer treatment plans, but this is uh, evidence-based, safe, appropriate. But for many of these interventions, you can see here, I need to work alongside nurses and allied care professionals and pharmacists um, to, uh, to allow patients to, for example, improve functional impairment with uh, strength and balance training, device evaluation, home exercise programs, fall prevention discussions, comorbidities, have a closer engagement with primary practice, uh, cognitive impairment, limiting as much as possible the 
complexity to the treatment, but also understanding what is the decision making capacity of these patients. More problems, counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, but also drug treatments, uh, malnutrition, again with uh, oral uh, nutrition supplements, but also oral care, assistant women preparation, polypharmacy, the prescribing or assessing adherence to non oncologic medication can also impact on uh, the delivery um, and the safety of anti cancer treatment, social support problems, transport assistance, nursing home health, caregiver management, home safety evaluations. Next slide, please. Um, comprehensive genetic assessment takes time, although I would argue it's time incredibly well spent for our patients. This is the reason why in the geriatric oncology field, uh, we have developed uh, and validated geriatric screening tools that essentially are quick, easy tools that take, as you can see in the busy table, uh, between um, two to 15 minutes, sometimes for patients to complete, sometimes completed by healthcare professionals. Essentially, these tools are able to predict the outcome of a CGA so that I can identify um, who are those patients that actually I can manage without any initial enhanced um, workup beyond simply an oncology workup, whereas who are those patients that actually would benefit from an input of a wider MDT, including where available geriatricians, nurses, and like a professionals and pharmacists to develop an integrated treatment plan. Next slide, please. Um, over more than 20 years of clinical implementation of research, we have learned that uh, CGA in this patient population is associated with uh, um, being more accurate in predicting the prognosis of our older patient with cancer, can uh, predict functional and decline of cancer treatment, can shift uh, treatment decisions, cancer treatment decisions in up, up to one third of patients, can identify that those problems that are sometimes neglected by routine considerations, for example, Eco performance status or carnosal performance status. Over the last four years, we've also learned from phase three randomized clinical trials that with CGA, we can also reduce the severity and the frequency of uh, side effects of systemic anti cancer treatment. We can reduce unplanned hospitalizations on systemic anti cancer treatment. We can improve quality of life on systemic anti cancer treatment. And we can reduce hospitalizations after surgery. Next slide, please. And this is the reason why increasingly more and more guidelines, international guidelines, as you can see here, um, started recommending the use of genetic assessment in the care of older patients with cancer whenever we make anti-cancer treatment decisions for this population. The American Society of Oncology Guidelines, published in 2018 and updated last year, suggest that whenever we um, give, recommend systemic anti-cancer treatment, to all the patients with cancer at the age of 65, we should look at physical function and performance, functional status, nutrition, social support, mood, comorbidities, cognition with validated um, geriatric assessment tools. We should also use chemotherapy toxicity prediction tools. We will spend some time on this later. A prognostication tool to understand what is the prognosis of the patient, to understand am I really going to recommend this patient with this high risk of mortality 10 years, a six months course of uh, uh, toxic chemotherapy and geriatric screening tool. G8 is one of the most widely used, um, but there are several others that can be used in uh, specific um, settings to identify who are those patients that require CGA. Psych recommendations, obviously we are biased, but we do uh, publish recommendations. We have published recommendations on specific genetic assessments and specific genetic screening tools that can be implemented in oncology pathways and national cancer, uh, comprehensive cancer network guidelines that get published twice a year, specifically on all the adult um, oncology. Next slide, please. These are, for example, the two randomized clinical trials, CAP-70 again, that demonstrated the patients, uh, older patients over the age of 70 for CAP-70, over the age of 65 for gain uh, with uh, um, cancer, initiating new life systemic anti-cancer treatment. They experienced less uh, severe systemic treatment side effects when they receive um, geriatric when they undergo geriatric assessment and receive specific treatment recommendations. CAP-70 was focusing on, on the palliative setting alone. GAIN was focusing also on both palliative and curative setting. GAP-70 was running in community oncology practices in the States, not in fancy cancer centers. GAIN was running in one specific cancer center in, um, in the States, but they both documented very consistent results. And GAP-70 also tells us that perhaps the reason why patients are undergoing this enhanced care pathway had less toxicity is because oncologists were also using 
lower doses of systemic anti-cancer treatment, but with no impact on survival outcomes at six and 12 months. GAIN also documented an increased completion of advanced directives, which is also quite important to remember, especially for this patient population. Next slide, please. This is the third study in Tejeret that was focusing on quality of life, randomizing uh, more than 150 patients over the age of 70, initiating SACT, systemic anti-cancer treatment, to receive or not the input of a geriatrician for 24 weeks. And not surprisingly, perhaps, patients randomized to receive the input of a geriatrician had better quality of life metrics as measured with this elderly function index, which is a, a, a tool derived by the C, from the C30 EOTC questionnaire. Next slide, please. But this is also the study that documented for patients randomized to receive the input of a geriatrician, a 39% reduction in emergency presentation, a 41% reduction in unplanned hospital admissions, a 24% reduction in unplanned hospital overnight bed days, and lower early treatment, systemic treatment discontinuation due to complication in patients randomized to receive a more holistic approach. So this is a wonderful proof of concept from me that really demonstrated this. Um, models of care can also be seen possibly as sustainable, more sustainable for hospitals and wider healthcare systems in the future. These are all resources that we can save to the system and we can reinvest to pay the salaries of geriatricians, nurses and wider multidisciplinary teams. Next slide, please. So the field of geriatric oncology was really born in the late 1980s when uh, we started realizing that we were seeing predominantly cancer in older patients. Um, but now we are seeing more and more um, specific care models being implemented in many areas of the world. Initially only in North America and specific European countries like France. In France, the National Cancer Plan funds the creation of oncogeriatric units since 2006, but now also increasing in other areas of the world, Asia, um, uh, Australia, uh, South America, with dedicated multidisciplinary care programs, with research programs, uh, delivering, for example, the studies that we, we, we discussed, and international societies such as SIA, who really um, gather all uh, clinicians and investigators with multiple different backgrounds with an interest in the field. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of uh, um, care model delivery, essentially, if you look at what is available around the world, there are three main care models, what we call the consultative model, which is what the GAP-70 study exemplified. You have an oncology team doing geriatric screening, referring patients based on geriatric screening to a geriatric oncology or geriatric team that then performs CGA and refers the patient back to the oncology team for the cancer management, typically systemic anti-cancer treatment. A shared care model, what the Integerate study exemplified, where you have an oncology team working alongside the geriatric team throughout the entire cancer treatment trajectory so that um, specific uh, aspects of the care of the patient may be prioritized, for example, nutrition before functional impairments and so on, and uh, um, while the patient undergo whatever anti-cancer treatment. The comprehensive model where you have a single team that takes care of the oncologic and non-oncologic interventions, so typically including medical oncologists and where available geriatricians, uh, nurses, healthcare professionals, pharmacists, wider MDT members. So there isn't the right or wrong formula here. It's all about understanding what would work best in each specific institution. Next slide, please. Just giving a one minute more uh, warning Thank on you. the slides. <laughs> this is um, just um, about SIOC. SIOC is, as I say, the professional societies, including uh, uh, medics, uh, nurses, uh, like professionals, pharmacists with an interest in geriatric oncology. Um, what we do is essentially education, uh, but we also so publishing, for example, uh, guidelines, recommendations, but also holding our annual conferences, advanced courses in geriatric oncology that Anne uh, Byron was the first nurse to attend around the world, uh, advocating for implementation of national cancer plans, considering all the patients with cancer, but also for more research in all the patients. So um, I would encourage you to uh, look up uh, what we do on our website. Next slide, please. And our priorities, as I mentioned, are to improve the care of the patient with cancer it's first education. So, for example, integrating geriatrics in the curriculum of any healthcare professionals in the cancer workforce, providing um, educational materials for the, for the oncology workforce, uh, raising awareness among the general publics, 
clinical practice, which means developing dedicated care models, but also developing specific recommendations and guidelines based on what is the evidence available, what are the gaps of knowledge at the moment, what should be the research priorities. Um, research, obviously, it's important, making clinical trials more meaningful for all the patients with cancer, building up on the uh, evidence uh, supporting the use of genetic assessment, the treatment interventions in this specific patient population. And as I said, talking with other stakeholders, including uh, international agency, patient advocacy group, policymakers, to really um, foster the development of dedicated care models in each single country. Next slide, please. Uh, this is really what drew me to the field of genetic oncology. This is what I would call precision oncology, not just a consideration of a number of fancy biomarkers that now we are used to test uh, in the tumor of our patient, but also testing biomarkers of the health of our patients or the host of the tumor. So geriatric assessments, um, what is the patient life expectancy? What is the patient organ function? How does this interact with the comorbidities? Um, in terms of quantity, quality of life impacts, what matters to the patients, and integrate them with tumor-specific consideration. Next slide, please. Um, these are some resources that, again, I would encourage you to uh, look up and join uh, SIOC, CARC, and so on, if you're interested to learn about uh, uh, the field. JGO, Journal of Genetic Oncology, is our official publication, published by Elsevier. Next slide. Let me finally invite you to our next annual meeting in Montreal uh, this October. And that's my last slide, I think, the next one. And thank you very much for the attention. Um, I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Nicola, and thank you. I know that you're joining us from um, Dublin, where you're off to another uh, to do another presentation. So thank you very much. Um, I don't see anything in the chat, but um, Faye, did you want to come in there? Did you your hand up? No? No, sorry, that was accidental. It was an accidental hand. <laughs> but there is another hand I can see now. I can see Mary's hand. Mary, if you want to go ahead with your question. Hi there. Thank you, Nicola. Um, <clears throat> you kind of touched on it a moment ago, but just about the biomarkers um, and the relationship between the immune system, um, you know, neuro, neutrophil and lymphocyte ratios and things like that. From what I've read, it's quite an underused within um treatment pathways at the moment. I, I just want to get a bit of a feel for your thoughts on that and where we're going with that in the future. That's an excellent question, Mary. I think, um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a clinician, not a scientist, so, but I, I would say that that's one of the key directions, for example, also our field should increasingly take. So what are, for example, markers of um, aging, bio, biological markers of aging? Um, you mentioned a few of them. Uh, how can we leverage them to integrate them with uh, frailty assessment to get mm. the better idea of what is the health status of that patient and maybe uh, give that patient specific treatment option based on that. There are some increasing data, for example, immunotherapy, immunosenescence, for example, um, to try and explain whether uh, immunotherapy, uh, which is now a, a big, big uh, um, chapter of what we do in oncology, works differently in older or so younger patients that may be related to different uh, characteristics of immune system cells. Um, but these are still early data, so they're still being developed. Within SIOG, again, um, we have uh, people that are more expert than me uh, chairing this specific working group. There is also a trans translational um, working group, translational research working group, that essentially is uh, hoping to advocate for more uh, research on these specific aspects okay. uh, to better, um, to make better treatment decisions, more accurate treatment decisions for our patients. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, if anybody else has got any other questions, um, we've got one here from um, Philippa. Thank you, Philippa. And she's saying it's brilliant work and every team should be thinking about integrated on oncogenerative care. Is this model being widely implemented within the UK yet? Yeah, that's another excellent point. So clinical implementation uh, wise, there are some countries that have really uh, spare added it for many, many years. The UK has been lagging behind, um, I think until now, uh, because uh, um, essentially in, uh, I think if I'm correct, in 2013, um, for example, 
Guys and Thomas's Hospital pioneered the first geriatric oncology service to be implemented in the UK, um, which is a, a consultative service led by the geriatrician, uh, Dr. Tanya Kalsi, Dr. Daniela Rari. And now we are seeing more and more services being implemented. For example, one in our in our centre, the Royal Marsden, that was implemented in 2021, um, at the Christie, another cancer centre in Manchester in 2022, uh, and more services being developed across the UK. There isn't at the moment a national strategy. Um, I've been listening to some presentation at this meeting in Dublin today. Um, I understand that we don't even have a national cancer plan in England, which is uh, uh, would probably be a good solution to you know foster a more national strategy in this specific aspect but um there is increasing momentum last year in november the royal college of physicians and the royal college of radiologists in collaboration with macmillan and psych published some guidance on how to implement frailty assessments in oncology care pathways um, they're available on the website um, i'm sure that if you google rcp rcr frailty assessment uh, it will come up quite quickly but um, yeah, we are seeing more and more momentum because finally we are realizing that we need to, to catch up with other, other countries ASAP. 